great to be back with you. I can see that still 160 people are online and uh, we're just getting better and better. Uh, the program now is really quite packed. Uh, we're going to get through it um, and allow time for questions at the end. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce, first of all, um, Dr. Kirsty Short, who's an NHMRC fellow at the University of Queensland, uh, made an enormous contribution already to understanding the science uh, and the biology of influenza and COVID, uh, um, has been a leading light in the public understanding of, of COVID. Uh, and I love reading what she writes um, across all sorts of levels from professional through to the public. So um, it's a real pleasure to introduce Kirsty. Now, I always thought a coracle was a small round boat, but she's going to explain what coracle really is. Thank you, Kirsty. Thanks so much for that introduction, Robert. Can everyone hear and see okay? Yep, brilliant. All right, so I'm just going to talk to you um, very briefly about some of the work that I've been doing with the Immunisation Coalition, trying to address the issue of the COVID-19 vaccine rollout in Australia. And I think we can all fairly safely say that this has been suboptimal in many ways. So when we look at the vaccination rate uh, around the world, and this is looking at one dose of the vaccine, these rates would certainly be a lot lower if we were looking at fully vaccinated. You can see that Australia's rate is sitting probably on par with South Korea, um, which isn't that much higher than India, to be honest. Um, and it falls significantly short of countries like the UK, France, Canada, and the US. Now there's lots of reasons why our vaccine rollout has been problematic and I could probably give you a two hour talk on that. Um, certainly one of the problems has been availability and, and that's due to a lot of different factors, but we do have a shortage of vaccine available and I know many people who are wanting to be COVID-19 vaccinated and who just can't. But we also have a problem of hesitancy and this is a little bit related to how the rollout's gone and in particular we've had a lot of people who've been reluctant to take the AstraZeneca vaccine, even in those individuals who are 60 and plus uh, for whom it's recommended. And um, we also have a little bit of a problem and I, I sense this talking to people in the community that a lot of people don't perceive the need for vaccination in Australia. Um, and it, it comes down to a sort of risk benefit analysis where they see very low rates of COVID-19. And so the potential adverse side effects of vaccination, in particular the blood clotting linked to the AstraZeneca vaccine is seen uh, to be weighted more heavily. And we're now getting some evidence of perhaps myocarditis occurring in younger individuals who've been Pfizer vaccinated. So there's a lot of challenges that we face in the rollout in addition to availability. Now there's been lots of great work by people um, trying to put the risk in particular of the, the blood clotting in the AstraZeneca vaccine in context. And so this was a great article in the conversation that put the AstraZeneca vaccine risk um, of the TTS blood clotting in relation to other activities that you may or may not do, such as bungee jumping, skydiving, uh, scuba diving, which is probably something more common. And then also in relation to the lightning strike, pedestrian accident, car accident, all those sorts of things that we live with on a daily risk. But I think talking to um, clinicians and talking to people in the community, there's still this struggle to put this risk in relative terms. And this is something that we want to really develop as a tool for Australia. Um, and in particular, we want to adapt this idea of a COVID-19 risk calculator. So this has been done in the UK and it's been done very successfully in the UK where they developed uh, the QCOVID tool. So this is essentially an online tool where you can put in your age, your sex, BMI, uh, your underlying medical conditions, and it will give you, sorry, I don't know why my slides are jumping. It will give you uh, an associated risk, uh, a risk calculation of COVID-19 associated death and COVID-19 associated hospital admission. So these are my particular risk factors. Um, thankfully, I'm not in a risk group. So they're very low, but this might be higher in an individual with one or more underlying conditions. So we think that this would be a really useful tool to apply in an Australian context where an individual could go online, calculate their risk, and then sort of make this risk 
relative to the risk of vaccination. So this is something that um, we want to implement in Australia, but we want to adapt this QCOVID tool. So uh, this QCOVID tool is based on the uh, prevalence rate of COVID-19 in a UK context. And obviously that's not very relevant to an Australian context. So what we want to do is establish a sort of sliding scale of COVID-19 incidents that uh, you will be able to, sorry, my slides keep jumping. Um, now we've, uh, COVID-19 sliding scale that you will be allowed to able to adjust the incidents according to what's going on in the community, which seems certainly very relevant at the moment. We want to include the risk of disease um, if you'd had either the Pfizer or the AstraZeneca vaccination to emphasize to people the benefit of vaccination. Include the risk of TTS because that's something that a lot of people are concerned about and a lot of people are going to their GPs about. Potentially include the risk of myocarditis uh, and the risk of long COVID. And at the end, when the calculation comes up, we want to have relative risks uh, in, in terms of things like homicide or car accident. So we're still really in the early stages of this and we're talking with QCOVID about how we adapt it to the Australian context. But essentially what we want to do is create a tool that GPs and patients can use to start a conversation about the need and relative risk of COVID-19 vaccine, specifically in an Australian context. So I will leave it there, um, but basically I wanted to present this to you today as a group of individuals who are heavily involved in vaccination to take your feedbacks, your suggestion, what you'd like to see in this sort of calculator and where you could see this being implemented. And finally, I'd just like to thank everybody who has made this work possible and it's an ongoing effort. So um, feedback and suggestions are very much welcome. Thank you. Kirsty, that's lovely. And uh, so much discussion still to be had, but such a long way you've come already. And uh, can I encourage people to use the Q&A? Even if we don't get through your question today, I, I, I will guess that Kirsty and also our previous speaker, uh, Professor Raja Da could give us some really important answers. So don't be afraid to pose your questions in the Q&A and uh, we'll ask speakers to answer after the event if they possibly can. Now, our next uh, uh, event is the launch of a white paper. Um, I've known um, Dr. Jenny Hertz for a long time um, and uh, in many roles. And she, uh, for example, had a very senior role with Medicines Australia. Um, but she now runs her own uh, very important business called BioIntellect and the Immunisation Coalition has consulted with BioIntellect to uh, look at how can we improve adult vaccination and um, uh, yet another um, acronym, uh, VCR, will be explained. Uh, Jenny will speak first and then our chairman, our chairperson, Rod Pierce, will, will follow without introduction uh, because we all know who Rod is. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for the opportunity to present this paper today, Enhancing Adult Vaccination Coverage Rates in Australia. And before I start my presentation, I'd just like to pay my respect to the traditional owners of all the lands in which we're all meeting today, to their elders past and present, and to welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are joining us today. And I'm on the Guy Miguel people's land. So, um, Right, without uh, further ado then, I'd, I'd like to tell you a little bit about this paper that we've done in collaboration with the Immuno Immunisation Coalition, but also um, supported by Pfizer Australia. So we all know that vaccines are one of the greatest achievements of public health, and that prevention is an essential component of an effective health system. We have a strong national immunisation programme, but overall, Australia invests about 1.3% of the health budget into preventive health, which is a little bit lower than some other OECD countries, such as Canada, the UK, um, and New Zealand, for example, and some other countries are more in the range of 2 to 4%. You know, as we've just heard from Kirsty, um, the, the sort of mood around vaccine hesitancy is, is evolving quite rapidly and changing at the moment. So on the one hand, the COVID-19 pandemic has really emphasised the importance of vaccines, um, not only in Australia or around the world, but also that the role that community, the life science industry, governments and, and expert groups have um, all have a central role in, in um, safeguarding our return to normal life. Um, the NIP has been a cornerstone of the National Preventive Health Strategy, and I'm going to show my age a bit. I've, I first started working in vaccines in 1998, and 
for those of you that have been around that long, um, it was not long after Minister Waldridge at the time had launched the seven point plan for um, the um, National Immunisation Programme. So it's interesting now to reflect on, on that progress and look at some of the challenges we face with adult vaccinations. So when we look at uh, adult vaccination rates, of course, adult vaccinations relatively compared to childhood vaccines are newer on the National Immunisation program, program and coverage rates are lower. Um, and you know, a key driving factor there is that we do have a lack of reliable current data to monitor adult vaccination coverage. Uh, up until recently, reporting has been mandatory for children, but it's voluntary for adults. And whereas about 95% of children are now fully vaccinated, only 50% of older adults are fully vaccinated for influenza and pneumococcal disease. And as you can see from the reference on the slide, some of that data is actually quite old. That's a 2009 adult vaccination survey. And of course we do still, um, we're all getting used to the daily COVID counts at the moment um, and, the, and the lockdowns that we're facing. But you know, on, on average influenza still, we have 350 to 400 deaths in an average year and up to a thousand deaths in, in a severe year. With pneumococcal disease, we, we have an average of 2,200 cases per year, of which almost half can be related to serotypes that you can find in the vaccines. So we do still suffer um, morbidity and mortality related to these adult vaccines that are preventable. And of course, what we know from the seven point plan and the improvements in childhood vaccination is that these, there's been long sustained investments in public health education programs, financial incentives for healthcare professionals and parents, as well as key performance indicators and targets, all to improve childhood vaccinations. So this paper is really gonna make the case that similar attention is required for adult vaccination. And as you probably all know, we have a great opportunity to build on because now mandatory reporting to the Australian Immunisation Register will be implemented from July, 2021 as part of the COVID vaccine rollout. Um, so we've heard a little bit about vaccine hesitancy from the, from the previous presentation, but um, I guess prior to COVID in general, we had a situation where Australians did trust and support the use of vaccines with the majority of Australians strongly agreeing vaccines are important, are effective and, and safe. And, and we're in a state of flux at the moment as that changes with, with the daily news announcements about COVID vaccines. What we do know from work done by WHO that was referred to this morning is that the key factors that lead to adults being vaccinated are having a recommendation from their healthcare professional, education and awareness around vaccines and the threat of the disease they protect against, access to vaccination, and of course, social responsibility and social norms. So in terms of the methodology for our paper, we did a review of all of the um, literature we could find around adult vaccination rates in Australia, but also internationally. We reviewed the evidence of why adult vaccination rates were lower than childhood rates in Australia and looked at what factors were contributing to that. And then we identified what were some of the things internationally that we could consider best practice to help inform some strategies and recommendations that would be appropriate for Australia. Um, so our paper has come up with seven evidence-based recommendations that aim to build on the success of the NIP to better protect Australians and further reduce the, the pre prevention of vaccine preventable diseases. And these are organised in three themes. The first key area is around strengthening vaccination monitoring and accountability, where we recommend monitoring of adult immunisation rates through the AIR and follow, following introduction of the Mandarin Tree reporting in July. Then stepwise introduction of targets and KPIs and benchmarking of adult vaccination coverage, followed by um, um, appropriate support to immunisation providers to make sure that we can address those barriers. The second key theme that we wanted to make recommendations around was improving access to vaccination. And we're recommending promotion of the use of healthcare systems that provide notifications to immunisation Providers, you can see a couple of examples of that on the screen. Um, expanding access to vaccination services for medically at-risk populations and continuing to provide flexible funding to territories and governments, uh, to state and territory governments, as well as primary health, net, net, primary health networks to make sure that we can emphasize local immunization programs to support adult vaccination. And then the final recommendation is really around enhancing public awareness and understanding of vaccines, 
and we recommend designing a nationally coordinated public health campaign that will em emphasize a whole of life approach to um, preventive health. And that would include edu educational campaigns for the general public and providers, as well as tools to self-assessment of vaccine el eligibility and reminders and smartphone apps to provide advice to adults who are due to be vaccinated. So we're delighted to launch this report today. Um, it will be available soon on the Immunisation Coalition uh, website. So uh, it's a policy white paper entitled Enhancing Adult Vaccination Coverage Rates in Australia. And you can read more about the detail that led to those recommendations in that report. And finally, just I'd like to thank um, my colleagues at BioIntellect, Denitza Pradanovic, Katrina Lapham, Brian Keenan and Carolyn Austin, who developed with me the report and Professor Robert Boy, Mary Louise McClaws, and Kim Sampson from the Immunisation Coalition, and of course, Pfizer Australia for supporting this work. Thanks very much, and over to you, Rod. Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, again, thank you to BioIntellect, uh, members of the Immunisation Coalition who have allowed us to get this paper and the support from Pfizer, and our chance to look at the uh, what we can do for adults. As Jenny said, it's a seven point plan uh, and so it's deja vu, deja vu again, again, or again. And just as I also heard that South Australia's had an update on that we have to wear masks, apparently our crowd control is different. Drink, drinking and singing is also important and maybe ducking underneath footballs is gonna become a challenge in South Australia again. Looking back at our seven point plan that worked or didn't work for children, I'd like everyone to just spend the next few minutes thinking about what's different in the adult uh, program. And this, this provides a good, this paper provides a good background work on what we know has happened. But I just want everyone to just spend the next few minutes thinking about some of the, the things that children have got and what's happening in adults. So when we take a child who's two months old, their history, their immunological uh, story is fairly predictable. We look at a child at one year old, we've got a fairly uh, predictable, again, uh, uh, assessment of what we can predict is gonna be part of the immunology. But when we start, say at school, they're beginning to diverge. Their individual history is starting to be different. Their individual predictable immune response is not as accurate, not as tight. They've got life experience, they've started at school at different ages and they've get, got different health systems. So what's it gonna be like when they hit 50? And I'd just like us to reflect on that and think about a few people around Australia, what ages they are and what we think we would do looking at their history. Now, um, I'm gonna start with Pauline Hanson. Now, she apparently isn't sure of what age she is, but according to the official websites I've looked up, she's born on the 27th of May in 54. So she might be coming up for her shingles vaccine, but have a think about how you'd approach her vaccine history and what she's due. But remember that Malcolm Turnbull was born a couple of months after her. Is that the same history? Is that the same opportunity? Is that the same discussion as maybe with Gay Waterhouse? She was born in September 54. These people are 67. They're all Anglo-Saxon Australian, except their history, their immune understanding, their immune uh, original sin is all gonna be different. I think we need to see adults as a different group. How about we flick to people coming up to 60? They're about to look at whether they should have at 60, whether they should have an AstraZeneca or a Pfizer. Think about people born in 64. So what sort of difference would you approach Prince Edward? He's born on the 10th of March in 64. Boris Johnson was born in the same year. Sandra Bullock was in the same year. Different history, different system. America's different from UK. Russell Crowe was born in April 1964. They're 57 coming up to 60. What are you going to talk to them about? Look at some of our uh, Indigenous uh, people who we know. Kathy Freeman. She was born in 73. So she's about to be 48. What's her story? What's her pertussis? Ken Wyatt, he's in Parliament. He's coming up to 69. What's his influenza history? What's his shingles story going to be? So seeing as 50 seems to be an age that a few people have talked about today, and maybe that's the new 40, or maybe it's um, the new 30. So let's look at Nova Paris. She was born in 71, so at 50. She's missed the 69 uh, flu epidemic that killed millions of people. So her immune system hasn't seen that. 
She saw the 2009 one, but no others. Is she coming up for ho her whooping cough? What's her story? She's born in Darwin. Um, what's her story with meningitis? Other uh, bacterial diseases that she's come across? What's her HPV story? What's her pneumococcal story? Because there's been different programs that have been administered in her state before she moved uh, and her communities had different. So let's go back to say Ewan McGregor, born in the same year, a month difference from uh, Nova Paris in 1971, born in Scotland and moved to London in 1989. He was married, adopted four children, including people from Mongolia. He was working with UNICEF, traveled through India, Nepal, Republic of Congo, and he was working with UNICEF and immunization programs. So what's his experience? He's now moved to America in 2016. What's his immune history? So when he approaches you at 50, so going back to what happened in 1997, we had big changes. This was reviewed by Tillman Ruff and uh, 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 Terry Nolan. They said the major things they contributed, they think, were the three waves of policy change. It was backed then by high levels of political support and an integrated national system across the three levels of government. The three waves they've talked about were initially a better recording of state and territory and Commonwealth coverage, and a better coordination between the public sector and the private sector. They had the seven point plan, which we talked about, which was the incentives for parents when we talk about uh, no jab, no pay type thing. There was a greater role for GPs. There was a targeted uh, monitoring through the ACIR, immunization days targeting different programs, school programs, particularly for measles, because that was the issue there. We established the education research, NCIRS, and they had school entry requirements. So the beginning of, of what we've got now. Then the wave three was in 2005 and seven when TBAC became involved, when recommendations started to happen part of a national program. So in 97, Waldridge in parliament, this is in 1997 said, Australia has a 53% childhood vaccination rate and we're based on the 89-90 statistics. And that highlights the fact that we had data seven years out. So as we look at this enhancing adult vaccination program, remember it's different, it's not the same. When we wanna be working on data that's now, so we don't wanna be going on seven year data, we need an uh, immunization register that's up to date and we can actually access that. So that's gonna strengthen our monitoring and accountability. We need political support. Now look around the country with what's happening with COVID and we can't get a universal approach to lockdown or anything like that. So we still need to work on that. We need an integrated system and public awareness. We need to be able to coordinate the public and private, not only in the vaccine rollout and support general practitioners who are doing about a third of vaccine programs, but we need the public and private vaccine market, the government working with the private sector as well. And we need some consistent funding because it's not only the National Immunisation Program, it's also the fact that some of the, the vaccines aren't actually on the government list, they're not National Immunisation Program funded. So can I recommend everyone read this? Um, it's a fantastic document. It's given us a chance to review where we've got to so far. And it's an absolute privilege and a pleasure to be working with people who can write material like this that should help us reflect and move forward in a program that Australia needs, which is to think of adults as different. Remember, we all come from a different history and we're really got to make a change here because we should be getting 90% coverage in all of our population, not just the children. Thank you. Brilliant, thanks Rod. Uh, we're keeping incredibly well to time. Thank you, everybody. Uh, there must be uh, a lot more questions than just four. Uh, I'm sure that uh, a lot of things uh, are being stimulated by this discussion. Um, and while I've got a, 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 an, another moment, can I just say that behind the scenes, Susie Blackburn has been doing a superb job for the last eight hours. Uh, the team at Prax Hub have been supporting us tremendously, and we've only had some minor technical hiccups, mostly my fault. Uh, so thank you to them. Next, we've got um, Pneumosmart, the vaccination tool, which uh, is another immunisation coalition uh, uh, joint effort. And uh, we know Angela Newbound very well because of all the webinars she's given, uh, a tremendous uh, contribution to immunisation education for professionals around Australia. It's great to have her speaking again today. Thank you, Angela. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction, uh, Rob. Um, 
So and thank you to the coalition as well for putting on such a great um, event today and uh, for inviting me to speak. And I'm based on the land of the Ghana people here in Adelaide. Um, and they are our traditional custodians here. And I'd like to pay my respects definitely to all of the elders past, present and emerging um, right across the country. So many of the sessions that you've been hearing today have really overworked your brain. And uh, we know that certainly mid afternoon, your brain is probably really hurting. So my presentation really is to, to reduce your thinking and certainly uh, just rest your brain a little bit because, and particularly when it comes to uh, trying to navigate these really complex uh, pneumococcal vaccine pathways. So the NumoSmart tool, you know, if we're looking at the background of this um, tool, it really started uh, with the, the 10th edition immunization handbook back in 2013 and um, where the handbook introduced new pneumococcal recommend, vaccine recommendations based on this concept of category A and category B medical conditions. And there was some guidance that was provided um, around the vaccines and whether they were either going to be uh, NIP funded or at that particular stage, um, PBS funded vaccines. So while I was working at the Central Adelaide and Hills Medicare local um, at that time as the immunisation program coordinator and also as a private immunisation education consultant, I proceeded to deliver rounds of education to um, really advise the providers of the new recommendations that were in the entire new handbook, not just the pneumococcal um, chapter. But we've always, always known that the pneumococcal chapter in the handbook has been the most difficult chapter to interpret and to navigate. And, you know, we knew that these new recommendations around pneumococcal vaccine um, and vaccination pathways really lifted that to a whole new level. Um, there were really common fears across South Australian providers around um, how they're going to actually be able to navigate these pathways in a really busy um, consult with you know, time constrictions. And they were really crying out for a simple tool to, um, that would help them really quickly decipher what they should be offering their patients. Um, and that message was really loud and clear and consistent. So the Medicare local that I was working at, um, we, we did a survey across South Australian um, providers to try and get a really good understanding of the type of support that, that they were actually after. So <laughs> originally this were, tool was going to just be a, a paper version uh, desktop. And so we would think that a nice simple tool was probably going to be um, just a quick little flip chart. Um, with a series of flow charts for people to follow. Um, but there was pretty early realisation that flow charts were just not going to be adequate. And so enter the very, very, very clever um, information technology people with great database and software development um, experience. And so this tool started to take shape and, and it was not designed at all to replace the catch up vaccination calculator that exists for children, um, you know, the childhood program. Um, it was really a, a guide for clinicians that were consulting with patients that were over five years of age and that had medical conditions that were putting them at the highest risk or at increased risk of pneumococcal disease. So the tool was really developed over several months um, at the Central Adelaide and Hills Medicare local. Um, the tool contains just over about 100 different tables. And although my mind was about to pack up and leave and, my, and a straitjacket really became my new uniform, we really just pushed on and we, we undertook a trial with a select group of practices in Adelaide um, really to assess A, if the tool actually worked, uh, B, if, if the information it was providing was accurate, and C, if it was at least useful. 
Um, then became the, there came the announcement that the Medicare local network was going to be ceased on the 30th of June 2015. And so therefore, this newly created tool in its um, infancy um, was in need of a home. And hopefully after all this work, that wasn't going to be the trash can. So Kim Sampson and the Influenza Specialist Group, which is now the Immunisation Coalition, came to the rescue and agreed to host the tool um, on their website, which was really greatly appreciated. As you can imagine, the tool has undergone format changes and frequent updates as recommendations have changed um, with pneumococcal vaccination pathways over the years. And obviously there were major changes to these pathways and recommendations, um, as well as to the funding um, in mid 2020. So these changes were really designed, I suppose, um, with good intention to simplify the recommendations um, and protect those people that were most at risk we thought this could be the end of the NumoSmart tool, but uh, alas, the complexity remains. So the subject matter experts involved with this tool have worked over time to make sure that the tool is up to date for providers to be using. So if we look at the tool, once you access it through the Immunisation Coalition website, you will be greeted with the preamble. And this explains to the user that the tool has been developed by experts and is based on the pneumococcal vaccination recommendations in the Online Australian Immunisation Handbook. The terms and conditions advise that users um, accept all risk associated with the tool and should exercise their own independent clinical skill or judgment or definitely seek professional clinical advice. Um, if you're happy with all of the terms and conditions, Clearly you would press the proceed button and would take you to the next slide. The demographics on the patient's detail slide are for the clinician only. They are not, these demographics are not captured in the back end of the tool. Um, the back end data is completely de-identified. So once you put in the patient's details um, and we've got a patient here with us today that is called uh, Mr. Numo Popple, of course. Um, we would see that, and then we're going to be asking, does this patient identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander? And while the tool gives guidance about pneumococcal vaccine for young children, it does encourage providers to use the appropriate catch-up tables for children less than five years of age that are available in the Australian Immunisation Handbook, and it still does not replace the catch-up vaccination calculator. So our patient today, is um, a chap that is 43 years of age and he is not identifying as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. So our patient was diagnosed with pneumococcal pneumonia following severe influenza infection when he was 38 years of age. The tool is going to always default to the medical condition with the highest risk factor for pneumococcal disease and will proceed on that pathway which is the funded vaccine pathway. So if you were to select in the drop down box, previous invasive pneumococcal disease, as well as diabetes, for example, the tool would proceed on the invasive pneumococcal disease pathway. There is a specific pathway for hemopoietic stem cell transplant patients um, because they of course have their completely own recommendations. And should a provider select none of the above, the tool will default to the NIP schedule for non-medically at-risk healthy individuals. So you can put in more than one medical condition um, if that's what your patient has. We then need to know was this um, particular condition diagnosed very, very early in life, yes or no? Um, has the patient received any previous pneumococcal vaccines? So Mr. Cockle has been attending the practice for many, many years. So his GP was able to check his case notes and confirm that the patient had actually received a previous dose of pneumococcal vaccine. If the patient wasn't sure, um, they, so they either said no or unknown, 
then the tool would automatically default to the no vaccine pathway. So this particular patient, um, when he had his uh, vaccine, it was um, at the time a Pneumovax 23. So his GP was following the correct uh, recommendations at that particular time. So we're now five years down the track and by, in essence, he should be getting his second Pneumovax 23 because it's currently due. But we'll see perhaps that that's not quite the case. We do make a, um, a point here in saying that if there's no written records, that you cannot find any record of the patient receiving vaccine, or if they say they have, but they can't remember and there's no evidence of which type of vaccine, then uh, we would proceed as if the patient has not previously received any vaccines. Adult immunisation records have only been captured on the AIR since the 1st of October, 2016. Um, and in most cases, previous vaccine history has not um, been transferred across to the AIR from medical practice software. So sometimes you may need to be a little bit of a detective and really try and find some evidence from a previous provider, perhaps. But bottom line is, if there's no documented evidence of vaccination or which vaccine was received, um, we would suggest um, and certainly recommend that you start the schedule um, from scratch. Um, or otherwise, we, we may risk under vaccinating our, our patients and that poses a significant problem to them. So once you put in all of the, the information required, uh, you'll get a review page. So you can review the information that you've added to the, the tool and then you would submit those details. So based on the information provided, um, a vaccination report will then be displayed. And given the patient may have received one or more doses of Pneumovax 23, because you would have re recalled seeing on that previous slide, which vaccine, was it a conjugate? Was it a polysaccharide? Was it both or are we unsure? but it's not asking you how many doses that person may have received of any of those vaccines. So they may have received only the one dose of 23. They may have received two doses of 23. So the tool is going to display a summary that provides advice on both of those scenarios. Providers can then uh, save the summary electronically as a PDF or they might choose to print the summary out and scan it into patient files. And of course, providers are really definitely um, encouraged to, to send us some feedback um, via the little feedback button right at the bottom of the screen. And we are absolutely all ears if you can think of uh, some way that we can be doing this better or making the information clearer, we definitely would like to hear about it. So with this particular individual, you'll see in the summary that it's telling you what is due now. And so for while we said that's five years since this gentleman's last 23 valent, but the new recommendations now would be saying that we should be giving him um, a conjugate vaccine, so a 13 valent PCV. And so just, we definitely know that it's more than 12 months since that last dose of 23 valent, and we know also that it's an NIP funded vaccine for this particular individual. Obviously this individual needs a second dose of Pneumovax 23. Um, and obviously that would be five years from the previous dose of 23 valent, which we're currently at, but it is recommended now that we do wait 12 months, although two months is, is adequate um, in order, you know, from the time that we've given that 13 valent PCV. If we've um, got the same individual, but we've chosen diabetes, um, has had polysaccharide vaccine previously, but you will see now that the table is the same, except for the funding has changed to being a self-funded vaccine because diabetes does not now, um, is not now covered by the NIP vaccines. And of course the pneumococcal vaccines are not PBS listed. So. Like magic, 
Um, you will then get your recommendations of what you should be perhaps following for your patient and certainly it's a discussion point. But the tool is updated as required by a team of subject matter experts who live and breathe pneumococcal disease and vaccine pathways. Sad, but true. Um, it's easily accessible um, on your phone, um, via PC, wherever you'd like it to be. And it will quickly give you a recommended vaccine schedule and funding information that you need for your patient. It's important that patients receive the correct vaccine, the correct number of doses at the correct intervals and at the correct time to reduce the likelihood of pneumococcal disease burden. And so we really encourage all clinicians to be using this tool. And once again, I'd really um, encourage you to uh, give us the feedback once you have used the tool. So in regards to a little bit of data of have providers actually been using this, this tool and what does the back end data actually tell us? So of the 6,131 entries since um, about October last year, 25th of October last year, we probably suspect that there's probably about a hundred of those entries that were just testing the tool. Um, so probably deduct 100, but however, we've still got really fairly good numbers. However, we believe there's more opportunity to promote the tool and, um, and hopefully providers will find it really useful. And we can see from this small amount of data, um, potentially there was a total of 2,719 patients that were identified as not being vaccinated as recommended. So that, you know, really hopefully should um, tell us that those patients hopefully now have had a conversation with their provider and received the appropriate um, doses of the appropriate vaccines. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you found it interesting and please don't be shy, use the tool and certainly let us know what you think. And I hope that this presentation will help you feel quite confident and comfortable using the tool. So little challenge for you, go back to your practices and just select 10 patients that, that have some medical at risk criteria, put them through the tool and identify and see if they're vaccinated appropriately or not. So thank you very much. Thanks heaps, uh, Angela, that was great. Um, uh, we're coming to the end, but we've still got some interesting uh, talk uh, by uh, Corey Ackland which I'm looking forward to. Um, the whole question of needle phobia is incredibly important. Uh, up to 50% of people are scared of needles and it influences the decision to vaccinate in 10 to 20%, but Corey will have better details than me. Um, it, there's a couple of questions on already that I ask uh, Rod to consider uh, answering when we get there. So just forewarning Rod. Um, and, uh, and now it's uh, with great pleasure, we uh, hand over to Corey Ackland and really looking forward to your presentation, Corey. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so yes, my name is Corey Ackland. I, a little bit about me, I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm the clinical director and I founded the Sydney Phobia Clinic some five years ago. Um, and this practice is dedicated to the treatment of specific phobia. Um, and one of the main phobias that we do see is needle phobia. Um, so I'm really excited to be able to share a little bit about this phobia, um, as obviously it is um, of, of key impact in, in your field. Um, and I'll just progress through um, with a little bit about the sort of um, background of needle phobia and how it presents as a difficulty and then what you might be able to do to get a jump on some improvements for your clients. Okay, so when we're actually looking at, at the, the problem as it may present in your office, um, from the client's point of view, you know, we're experiencing anxiety, fear, pain, and that's even if they get into your office. We also know that a huge part of the needle phobia problem is that they're not presenting at all, that they are avoiding any number of medical uh, procedures and certainly uh, needle related procedures. From your point of view, from the, the practitioner, it's obviously very resource intensive. Um, it may require a lot more time. It may require a lot more materials and equipment. Um, in some case, it requires a lot more people. 
Um, and then it also impacts the greater community because it does have this general avoidance of procedures, which obviously makes it uh, have the impact of reduced um, pro, uh, preventative healthcare things. Um, and so these people obviously have poorer health, health outcomes. Just to dispel a couple of myths right from the get go though, because there's also a lot of misconceptions around phobias generally um, and needle phobias. And these myths are perpetuated in, in my field as well um, as out there in the community. The myth that everyone has a phobia, that everyone has that thing, um, often people referring to things that they don't like and comparing phobias are in these same lines. We know that this isn't the case and that phobias are in a lot of cases quite severe and quite debilitating. Um, there's the misconception that they are very mild issues, that they actually don't need to be treated or taken seriously. And this is a very interesting one because often the clients that come for treatment at Sydney Phobia Clinic also report having had very appropriate psychological treatment in the past, um, but never considered bringing up the phobia or having a great relationship with their doctor, but just never considered bringing up the phobia. Or maybe that they've mentioned the phobia a couple of times offhand, um, but felt that it was dismissed. And generally there's this air that it's just one of those things and don't worry about it. There's a misconception that something really, really super bad has to have happened in the past, that there must be this traumatic onset to a phobia. Um, and certainly this can be the case, but it is not always the case. Um, and quite promising, it is also something that doesn't make a difference to treatment. So we don't need to be able to identify any particularly traumatic or otherwise negative onset event to be able to see good improvements for the client. There's the myth that it can't be fixed and that it is just something that needs to be tolerated, which we also know is not true. Um, that it isn't actually an issue of psychological treatment, um, but from a psychological point of view, it is actually one of the most straightforward uh, conditions to treat. That people just need to get over it and just sort of face their fears. Um, and that needles in particular aren't that painful, where in actual fact, the client quite recognizes this. Um, and it, it is the case that concerns can vary and be not just about the pain, but about these other kinds of components as well, which I'll sort of get into. So all of those myths aside, when we look at needle phobia, we, this is a diagnosable psychological disorder. Um, these are the criteria set out in the DSM-5. Um, there is a marked fear or anxiety about the specific situation, um, which can often be articulated by uh, adults, but may include crying tantrums or, or clinging behaviour in children that these situations almost always provoke this immediate fear or anxiety, that the situation is actively avoided or endured with intense fear or anxiety. Um, and in that latter case, what we would usually see is a suite of what we call subtle avoidance behaviours that are being employed to assist the endurance of the situation. That the fear or anxiety is out of proportion to the actual danger posed by the situation that the fear or anxiety is persistent, typically lasting for six months or more. Um, and it's the case with many adults that present with the phobia that this has been of some difficulty, even maybe subclinically for a number of years, even if it's worsened to be more of um, clinical relevance in, in the more recent months. Um, and the catch-all for DSM-5, um, and which again goes against the, the myths I previously stated, um, that this fear or anxiety or avoidance causes clinically significant distress or impairment in important areas. And this is also why needle phobia is my, you know, I say favourite phobia to treat. Um, because the impairment that is posed by needle phobia is quite significant. And it's not just around a, a delay or an avoidance of a particular procedure. Um, most of the clients that I see are uh, actually impaired in a number of really important life domains. So these are clients that maybe um, are putting off or not even considering parenthood for concern of the needles involved in the pregnancy. Um, they may be avoiding travel because of the need for travel vaccinations. Um, and any number of things like this become even more complicated um, when there is a phobia underlying it. 
some interesting facts about needle phobias. Um, this is a phobia that we see affects men equally to women. Um, so this is different to a number of other phobias and other anxiety conditions. Um, and there's a number of reasons why this may be. And the, the key to which is that women tend to be uh, more help seeking of psychological issues. Um, but men, uh, one of the theories is may find it more difficult to mask their concerns around a needle phobia um, because, you know, sat in, in a chair and, and literally at a point of being uh, injected, um, their symptoms might be just difficult to manage. Needle phobia clients, these are also our fainters. Now, they don't all faint, um, but we are certainly seeing the fainters within this phobia, whereas um, clients with other phobias tend not to faint. They may feel faint, but they don't actually faint. Um, and interestingly, fainting is very often the phobic concern. So some clients, the concern is all caught up around the, the knowledge or the anticipation that they may faint having maybe fainted before. Um, the prevalence rates are around 10 to 15 percent for clinical cases, but then we see this huge range of subclinical needle anxiety. So the prevalence is up around the 40, in some cases, 60 percent. Um, and the important thing about this is that these are also clients that are adopting really unhelpful behaviours and attitudes towards procedures. So they may be delaying, um, significantly delaying getting their injections, um, which obviously can have these sorts of knock-on effects. Um, the other interesting thing about needle phobias is it can generalize into really interesting areas or not generalize into where we might expect it to go. So some people may find it difficult to even have conversations around needle related procedures, um, whereas other people may be very able to get um, injections, but not blood tests or uh, a number of our needle phobic clients um, who can't even watch a video of a blood test can get Botox injections or dental needles. Um, so it doesn't always have to make sense, uh, but it is certainly this uh, thing that can incorporate a number of different areas um, or be very, very specific. And in that way, it's different for every needle phobia person um, in terms of what they find more difficult and what they find easier. Um, so we might commonly see that injections are considered easier than blood tests, but for the next client, it might be the complete reverse. Um, and as I said, the things that are included versus not included. What is also uh, often very different is what the specific concern is. So here are some of the common concerns associated with needle phobias. So there is concerns around the pain often, but not always. Concerns around fainting, um, concerns around the blood aspect. There's a very common concern around feeling trapped. This idea that once they walk into the, the GP's office or the pathologist uh, room, that the procedure um, will then sort of go ahead whether they're still consenting or not, um, or that they won't be able to put a stop to it, or they won't be able to slow it down. So this idea of control can come up. Um, the idea of a needle piercing the skin being both the worst feeling ever, but also something that becomes a subject of imagery to the client, that they over imagine this aspect um, of a procedure. The concerns that it will be dehumanizing. So often this does have some sorts of trace backs to previous experiences, um, particularly where they may have been restrained um, as, as a child for injections, um, but then having subsequent experiences where they felt that their concerns were invalidated or that the procedure itself just felt very um, kind of uh, production line. Concerns about control, catastrophic concerns of something going wrong, concerns of the anxiety response. And this is very common by the time someone comes to treatment that it is equally about the anticipation of the anxiety that they will feel as it is about the actual procedure. Um, the disgust response can be quite marked, particularly with uh, blood related needle procedures. Um, recollections to previous bad events uh, and also concern, particularly for adults, that they will freak out and that it will be embarrassing. So a lot is wound up in needle phobia and a lot more than I think is, is often considered um, when you see an anxious person walking in or talking about a procedure. So a little bit about the development and maintenance of phobias. So as I mentioned before, there is often a presumption that there was a traumatic event in childhood that um, set a phobia down the path. 
Um, but as I also said, this is not always the case. And even if there is a negative event in the childhood, that actually doesn't need to be anything particularly traumatic. Basically, it is negative learning that's laid down in the brain. Um, and we can sometimes know what that is. And as I said, sometimes we don't always remember or can identify what that is, um, but this isn't important for treatment. Um, that negative learning experience can either be um, personal um, or it could be vicariously learned. So it could be observed often, um, you know, observing a caregiver's uh, procedure or something like this. The negative portrayal um, can influence the initial learning as well. So this can be by conversations um, that, that people have been a part of. It can be pop culture presentations um, or you know, just hearing these kinds of negative stories or seeing negative imagery um, can set up that initial procedure in a way that can then um, develop a phobia. Lack of latent inhibition. Um, so this is where there may be um, poor experiences in, in the past. And I don't mean poor as in negative, but more um, just insufficient, insufficient experience uh, with the subject of the phobia, um, which means that then if something is not desirable in the first instance, it doesn't have the weight of all of these positive experiences to balance it out. So these are the, the common um, things that will onset a phobia. Um, however, what's really important to recognise is that a whole bunch of things can onset a phobia. They can be very different than what maintains the phobia. And so here are um, the maintenance components. So subsequent reinforcing events um, can maintain a phobia. And so this may be actually negative events, but interestingly, it can also be just what the client considers to be a, a negative event. Um, so even having to um, you know, be restrained um, or having to be uh, talked into um, a procedure may be considered uh, another reinforcing event for the client. Avoidance or subtle avoidance behaviours we consider to be the most potent, uh, potent maintainers of phobias, and I'll go into that in, in a little while. But what's really important to recognise about this is that the more that a client may avoid um, little minor procedures or proactive procedures, um, the more likely that they're setting up a more self-fulfilling cycle or a reinforcing cycle, um, because most likely then the next procedure they have is more important, um, probably bigger, and therefore more likely to reinforce all of the, the horror that they were expecting to be related to needle phobias. So in that way, um, I guess what I'm saying is that it, it's really important if you do feel like your client is um, a little bit anxious around needles, that you're encouraging them to take kind of any opportunity to have a needle related procedure so that they're having more of a positive experience or at least more of a neutral experience, um, which is setting a better scene before they're needing to have something that may be bigger, more invasive, more important, more pressured, et cetera. Okay, so then what we're looking at is sort of, you know, the, the why uh, a phobia is the way it is, why the body and the brain reacts in the way it does. Um, and we like to step back um, and, and talk about the anxiety um, as that sort of fight or flight response, which I know you would have heard of, of before. Um, but this is to kind of um, reposition this phobia away from something that often has this reputation of being irrational, illogical, or as we said, sort of markedly excessive. Um, because when we see that fight or flight response, we know exactly what it is, right? We know that it is this mobilization of the body's resources to really appropriately and adaptively um, manage a perceived threat, such as uh, the bear in the woods. Um, but we also know that we only have this kind of response as our threat response. So any way that we interpret a threat will onset those physiological feelings. Um, and it's important to understand their adaptive uh, reasons so that we're in a better position to kind of manage them down. So here we've got those uh, classic uh, anxiety symptoms that may be elicited and their adaptive response. Um, so the disturbed breathing rate is really common. But the other thing that's really important to note about that disturbed uh, breathing rate is it's not uh, often um, or not simply hyperventilative disturbed breathing, but it may also be a breathing hold. So um, just 
kind of be aware that it can present in, in either of those ways, but have the same effect. Um, even if we're not aware how the breathing is disturbed, if we've got that increased heart rate, which serves to transport that oxygen around the body, uh, we know that the breathing would be disturbed in some way. Um, and then we can also have some of these other symptoms, which also tend to be a focus of the anxiety as well. Um, but then it's really important to, to note that we've got these two pathways in the brain when we are uh, experiencing that fight or flight response, right? We've got this initial activation represented here by that red arrow, initial activation of the fight or flight response. But then we've got this secondary, more considered pathway, which can serve to manage down that fight or flight response um, and disconfirm that threat. When we're extremely anxious, as is often the case when someone's got themselves hyped up to actually be undertaking a procedure, um, there can be uh, either insufficient resourcing in that secondary pathway, which we call amygdala hijack, which kind of doubles down on that uh, threat appraisal, but also means that it's really difficult to think rationally, which is often what we're prompting uh, the client to do. Um, so we may need some initial calming in that first instance in order to be able to do that rational thinking that comes thereafter. But it can also be the case that a client uses this secondary pathway to actually bolster the initial threat response. So if they're saying more threat-based things to themselves or they're undermining their ability to cope, um, this will actually keep a threat response up when it otherwise would have naturally come down. It's this secondary pathway where we want to actually be um, uh, targeting with the treatment, um, where we are hoping to upskill a client with strategies to be able to then uh, reduce that threat appraisal and those threat feelings in the situation and have a more positive outcome. Uh, so we see all of these things come together in, in learning theory. And just to really quickly kind of take you through what is otherwise sort of the, the hallmark uh, model that we go through in treatment, uh, we can see here from this model that while anything can onset the threat response, anything can be seen as a, as a threat and give us those physiological symptoms, um, it's what we do during that moment that actually sets about learning that maintains the fear or otherwise weakens the fear. So any avoidance strategy, any subtle or explicit avoidance strategy uh, at that time um, I go back, uh, we'll, we'll see the learning reinforced that this thing is a threat, that it requires our threat response, and that it also requires these avoidance or escape strategies to enable us to survive another day. Um, and so while a client continues to engage in these strategies, we will see the phobia maintain at the very least, but most likely generalize and worsen. What we're then trying to see in treatment um, and with the support of various physiological and cognitive management strategies um, is that the client is able to stay in the situation, see that anxiety come down and actually get what we call contrary learning, which then sends the message that this situation isn't a threat, um, that it can be managed. Um, and we actually see that therefore that threat response is reduced in subsequent um, situations of orphobic concern. Um, so here is just our, our classic um, example of that phobic cycle, um, where if we're getting an injection and we're having concerns that represent a threat, of course, we're going to get our threat response. But it's when we act on that threat response by avoiding, delaying, using unhelpful coping strategies um, that we see a reinforcement of that cycle moving forward. The impact of needle phobia, um, as I've already kind of made a, a point about, um, you know, it is quite significant for the individual. Um, they have a strained relationship with the, with the health system. They're outright avoiding medical procedures. They're relying on a suite of unhelpful coping strategies, which is not helpful for them, but also quite burdensome on their family members potentially, um, but also on, on the medical system. Um, and they can be time consuming and somewhat burdensome. But really importantly, and this is the point that I, that I love to um, drum home, is that, you know, they have this whole other impact for, for them, which often adds to um, the, the pressure. You know, they're avoiding a whole bunch of things, not just procedures, um, but because of those procedures. But they're not otherwise um, anti-vaxxers, you know, they're, they're not otherwise against medical procedures. It's the anxiety that is leading to this strained relationship with the health system. 
And therefore, obviously, when it comes to, to COVID, we expect that these are clients that will be significantly hesitant to um, get the, the COVID vaccine or certainly not with the initial uptake. We've seen a massive increase in needle phobia referrals at the clinic. This has actually been really pleasing for us um, because it is important that clients seek treatment as early as possible. Um, the impact of COVID on needle phobia has been due to a few things. Um, often our phobias are worse um, depending on the environments that we're in and how conflicting those environments are to our, uh, our phobia experienced as triggers. Um, and at the moment, it's hard to, you know, even pick up your phone or turn on the TV without seeing some sort of media related to needles. Um, so this is seeing clients being kind of triggered in much more frequently. There's also some concern for the messaging around the vaccination in the way that clients feel like they're just going to have to do it. And that control aspect plays up quite significantly for them. Um, and a lot of that sort of apprehension, you know, looking ahead towards having to um, get a, a needle also plays in very poorly for a phobia. The really important thing to, um, to realise here and why I said it's been actually quite pleasing that we've seen an increase in needle phobia referrals is that we actually need a much longer runway for needle phobia um, compared to other phobias. We know that we can treat phobias very effectively in a very brief treatment um, of only some five sessions, but these five sessions will often be scheduled across maybe even three months rather than the five weeks that we might be able to do it um, with other phobias like animal phobias. But there's a variety of very effective treatment options um, that you could be considering for your clients. This Way Up is an online CBT program. Um, and then uh, there is a new uh, app called Overcome, um, which we've been working in partnership with to kind of uh, help provide a similar treatment that we do in office um, to clients more around the country. And the Overcome app integrates virtual reality treatment with online or app um, CBT. At Sydney Phobia Clinic, as I said, we deliver a manualized treatment. We integrate virtual reality to assist getting really valuable exposure um, into the treatment. Um, and so that literally looks like getting, you know, a, a number of injections or blood tests um, from, you know, a, an outside perspective, but also first person um, along with manualized CBT. Um, and of course, there is private psychology just as standard, which would under a CBT model begin with a diagnostic assessment, individualized treatment planning, and then sessions, however many as needed and until the, the client meets their goals. Um, I just also wanted to leave you with um, a little bit more about the Overcome app because they've also launched a, a new um, product which they're rolling out um, for free um, for GP clinics or pathology clinics that might be interested. Um, and this is um, for clients that haven't had effective treatment but are having difficulties and just really need to have a procedure done you know, today. Um, and this is a virtual reality distraction product where um, clients can can you know, enter what is a, a calming scene and kind of be taken out of the situation just to get this um, initial procedure done. Um, I will emphasize that um, for long-term goals, this is not adequate um, and this would likely see uh, the, the needle phobia perpetuate. Um, but if there is something that you are really needing to get done um, on a particular day, then this will get you kind of across the line. And as I said, this is uh, an initiative that Overcome is rolling out for, for free at the moment for um, a number of clinics in Australia. Um, so in terms of what you can do, it's really in, important to identify the signs of needle phobia. Not everyone feels comfortable to share it. There's a lot of shame and embarrassment about it, um, but it's about noticing that there is this uh, increase in symptoms, um, maybe some aversion to certain stimuli in the room, um, significant procrastination and delay getting required tests. Um, and maybe even a procrastination on other, um, you know, age appropriate um, events. 
it's important to normalize and not dismiss these concerns as we've spoken about this is really prevalent 40 to 60 percent of people have some level of needle-based anxiety um, and you know while it can be significantly severe in 10 to 15 percent of of the population um, it is certainly a concern that can be normalized very easily um, it's important to educate on the reinforcing effect of phobic behaviour um, and also the effectiveness of treatment. Um, let a client know that delaying the procedure may help in the short term, but certainly not in the long term, and that there is very effective treatment that can be very brief um, and, and help get improvements very quickly for them. Um, refer proactively to an appropriate service, you know, early intervention is always um, the best. So, you know, it's much easier to work with a, a non-generalised uh, subclinical case than it is to a very generalised, very severe case. Um, sometimes clients aren't even able to say the word needle makes it very difficult to work with, uh, you know, in the initial stages of, of treatment. So if we got them, you know, way back, um, it would have obviously been something that we could have got a jump on. Be more involved in the gradual exposure. So exposure here does often start with pictures, videos, works its way up to looking at needles, um, being in the room with someone else getting a procedure and so on and so forth. So um, also be really communicative and open to being involved in all of those other aspects um, that could be important for your client. Um, inviting them in when a, a family member is getting a needle or, or something like this can be super helpful. Recognize the time required for treatment. So if you do have some clients in mind that you're aware um, are uh, procrastinating or likely to procrastinate certain procedures that you think might be important for them, um, we are looking at a runway of at least two months, ideally three months for treatment. Um, so I'll just finish off with, with this slide here, again, just emphasizing that there is a number of clients that have had poor experiences um, that may be reinforcing their anxiety around um, needles. Um, there is a great proportion of people that are reluctant to get needles. Um, but that, you know, generally speaking, you know, we are seeing that this is a very appropriate, very effective um, condition to be treated um, for what is a, a huge proportion of the population that would benefit from that treatment. And I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Giving yourself a proper introduction, a big part of why people do or don't want to uh, be immunised. So really, really important. Um, I just wonder if you could uh, brag a little about your success rate and what you would say to key uh, immunisation personnel about uh, What's the, you know, what's the, that key one or two questions you can ask to quickly identify a, a phobic person who needs help? Yeah, certainly. So, I mean, we've seen a tremendous improvement at the clinic. Um, and I think that there's, a, there's a couple of reasons for that. Our clientele are very motivated by the time they come into our uh, clinic, um, which obviously helps that improvement. Um, but also it's a really targeted intervention, you know, so every session we are um, going through a really specific strategy. They're practicing that between sessions. We're coming back and troubleshooting and then building upon that. Um, but then we also have this integrated virtual reality, which means that we have the access to these environments that they otherwise can't really do. You know, it's, it's not practical for a client to go to their GP and request 20 injections, which is probably the amount that they might need to, to have before they're really seeing that they, you know, this does get easier, I do get better, um, but we can do that in VR. So it, it's just those kinds of um, tools and tricks that we can bring into the clinic that allows that improvement um, to happen a lot quicker for, for clients. In terms of those key questions to ask, you know, it, it is an interesting one because there is this huge normal range and there's a huge normal range of distraction that's often employed, um, which is usually how you would identify someone with a phobia is that they're, you know, not able to look at the dog or, you know, not able to look at a picture of a spider. Um, but when it comes to needles, I'm sure that you found that most of your clients aren't looking and you wouldn't say that most of your clients have an out of normal range anxiety um, around procedures maybe. Um, but I would still use that as um, a, a conversation starter, knowing that there is still a larger proportion of clients that may have difficulties um, that could be treated. And if you are noticing that there is um, pressured speaking and that conversations may be being employed as a significant distraction, if there is a difficulty looking at it, 
um, as well as if you can obviously see those noticeable signs of anxiety, um, I would just be asking, you know, do you find, do you find needles anxiety provoking? Do you mm -hmm. feel like the anxiety that you experience is within your control? Um, are you happy to tolerate it? Do you think it's something that you would like to see improve? Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Now, uh, if you look in the Q&A, there are seven or eight questions. And one of the nice things is that we're all experts here and people can answer the questions. They don't need us on screen to give all the answers. And there's a lovely answer from Jody Logan about the gap in uh, pertussis vaccination. And I commend you to look at the Q&A. Now, Jenny uh, Hertz, if I could turn to you. Um, <clears throat> there are a seven point plan and uh, I'm old enough to remember it, uh, Michael Woodridge as well. And I've heard him speak on it again uh, uh, at other meetings. What do you think is the lowest hanging fruit? What are the two, three or four things that we can achieve most readily, most quickly, get some success uh, on the board and to uh, be encouraged to do more? Thanks, Rob. Well, I, I think the fact that we've now got mandatory reporting is, is almost the, the starting point because if you're not measuring, um, then you can't really do much about it. I think that's the starting point. I guess what and um, I'll confess, many of you know, I'm, I'm not a healthcare practitioner, so I've, I've been on the other side of the fence um, supporting industry implementation rather than as a healthcare provider. But I would think that having specific immunisation rates for specific adult vaccines, again, is a simple way to start. So that, that speaks to having KPIs for adult vaccines. Um, uh, I guess incentives would be the next thing that we know were significantly successful with childhood vaccines. Um, and those are all policy decisions for government to make. Um, and then the one that I think is probably the hardest is the communication and the education, because as, as Rod talked about, there's so much nuance now with this um, enormous, you know, we've got a much, much, much more highly educated consumer than we used to about vaccines um, after the pandemic, but, but it's still very nuanced with enormous differences in health literacy and in, in education and understanding. And, and the nuance of communicating to adults, I think is gonna be the hardest. Yeah, um, I think that's a good reason to segue to, to Rod. A um, Couple of questions. Um, Michael Woodward has uh, put in a congratulation to Corrie, by the way, but also has asked, what should we be aiming for? What should be our KPI for people in the <laughs> 80s? Um, should we be aiming for 80, 90, 95% uptake like in children, or should we be a, bit, a little bit more conservative? I wonder if you could uh, field that, Rod, and any other question you feel happy to, to cover. Yeah, thanks. I think that we can target 90%. I can't see why not. In Australia, we know there's about a 3% natural uh, resistance or a 3% never going to make a difference. Probably 5% of people you'll struggle with, but it's over 90% who uh, can be helped and supported. And as Corey says, if there's any block, uh, you should be able to overcome it. So I would be aiming for 90% targets. I would um, think that um, the Zoster vaccine is a program where you actually need to provide resources to uh, providers so they can actually target it. And just from general practice point of view, uh, the dollars that we get for say COVID vaccines doesn't really cover the cost of, of talking to people. And it's just been introduced in the last couple of weeks. So there's actually extra funding, recognising that um, it's not just about giving the vaccine. It's actually about the time you spend checking whether that person needs it, what's, what's the appropriate advice. And I think that um, when we get adults, we've got lots of changes to follow. And just think at children, we've done well by sticking to the two, four, six months, 12 months, 18 months, and then school. But as I said before, when you get to school, you suddenly got a variation about uh, exactly when is school, um, what have they done? You're starting to look at different advice. And then if you look at uh, experience of where they've been overseas, have they come from a different program? And in adults, that's compounded because they've got life experiences. What have they been exposed to naturally? Where, do they, um, where did they grow up? What are the diseases they've seen? You've got their life vaccine differences because different states have got different programs, there's been different recommendations in different states. And just some examples that I can think of off the top is um, uh, vaccine changes. We've talked about the pneumococcal ones that Angela's uh, talked about. So it depends how old you are. Um, so a 50 year old's got a different experience depending on where they were during their 50 years. 
um, the, uh, the availability of vaccines have changed. The Zoster vaccine is going to be a different one. So a 65, a 70 year old and a 75 year old is going to have a different vaccine requirement. So you need someone to think about it. Look at the HPV. We had, a, um, I think in Northern Territory, we had two vaccines. Now, then it went out, then it went out, then it went to four, then it went to four. The uh, Shingrix, like I said, so um, ongoing changes, you need someone to actually spend time to do it. And in general practice, that translates to highly educated, amazing workforce um, that supports us. So the GPs know about it, but they've got an infrastructure in their practice. They can afford fridges. They can afford to let their nurses spend time talking to people. They can let their nurses look up the ACIR. They can look at all of that is the dollars. So the dollars to support providers is not make the providers rich, it's to support the infrastructure that allows us to get a 90%. So Michael, go for the 90%, I think, just needs to be supported. You, you mentioned Angela, so why don't we segue to Angela's thoughts on, on what you've just said and also, um, how she can, uh, you know, what, what's the key way you engage with uh, people about NumaSmart? What's, what are you finding there they're, they're most wanting from you? Um, look, you know, definitely um, fully agree with Rob. You know, I think we've got a really good chance of raising immunisation rates in adults, but providers need to be supported. These are, these are not uh, easy conversations to have, depending on which vaccine. Um, I think we probably need to really normalise a lot of these vaccines. You know, they've sort of been locked away for people that are really special, you know, special at risk, you know, type people. Um, and we see that a lot with flu vaccine, of course, you know, a lot of people, because they don't have a, a specific medical condition, think that they shouldn't, they don't need to have a flu vaccine. So we need to kind of normalise it. But, you know, getting back to the tool, um, you know, we're just using every opportunity that we possibly can uh, to be quite honest, Robert, to try and talk to providers around it. Um, this, I still get quite a number of practices contacting me every week, um, trying to navigate some vaccine pathway um, and they haven't heard about the tool. So I guide them and then I guide them to the tool and then I get a lovely email going, oh, this is fantastic, thank you. I'm gonna tell all of our doctors. So we just, uh, yeah, just need to get, get more of the word out there at every opportunity that we possibly can. And this is a great forum to do that. Um, Kirsty, I'm uh, in awe of everyone who's trying to do Coracle because you've done a lot of work and there's a lot more to do. Is there anyone you would particularly like to reach out to, to help? Is there people of different expertise or different background that you'd, you'd like some help from? Yeah, I think, you know, there's still a lot of different steps that we need to go through. Um, at the moment, it's really a matter of the data sets and finding a data set that is relevant to the Australian context, because obviously we can't use Australian based data for this because uh, we simply thankfully haven't had enough COVID-19 cases, although who knows, maybe that's going to change. Um, but at the moment, I think really what we need most is feedback from clinicians and from patients as to what they would find useful in, in the COVID risk calculator and what sort of uh, concerns patients are raising, what sort of things that uh, they think their patients in particular would be able to relate to in terms of relative risk. So any and all feedback is welcome and please feel free to email me after this if um, people have feedback that they wanna provide. There's uh, quite a bit of evidence uh, growing from the United States where mRNA vaccines have been used in tens of millions of uh, younger people, uh, more males and females getting myocarditis, pericarditis, I haven't quite got a, a handle on the figure. It looks like about one in 100,000. Um, but uh, I see that there's a plan to potentially include that. And I, I think that's a great idea. What do you think? Yeah. Um, one of the things we're looking at is to see how granular we can get that data. So ideally you would like to say, well, you know, I'm a 30 year old female, what is my specific risk? Um, but the issue with both myocarditis and the TTS is that we don't really have a good grasp on risk factors aside from age and potentially sex. Um, so there is 
some level of we just don't have the data. Similarly, we would like to integrate into the model uh, the risk of First Nations people for uh, severe COVID-19. But again, thankfully, because we haven't really had cases in our First Nations population, we don't have that data. So there are certainly some limitations as well. Okay. If, if Put your hand up if anyone desperately wants to say something, but Rod, I'll just throw a quick question to you. There was a, a question around what should be the gap between someone having a zoster, uh, actual, you know, the infection, the rash, and when they get a COVID vaccine. Should it be a week, a month? Uh, we look at it by saying, if it's going to mean you don't get any vaccines, you should consider having them together. The TAGI has recommended specifically you don't routinely book them together, but you can actually have them together if that's thought to be better than actually missing out. And that applies to a lot of our vaccines that um, someone comes in, they're not 100%, but there's certain absolute contraindications like a high temperature. But generally, it's better to actually have a vaccine than to miss out at all. So that's got to be balanced. And that's, again, where there's got to be some assessment of that person's risk, the assessment of what's going to happen if they actually miss them. But uh, ATAGI recommends it, and the, the usual advice is to separate them by two weeks. But you should look at the individual situation and make a call. And again, that's why the time and effort is needed in adult programs to make sure you actually get it right. Jenny, you've been involved with Australia international and internationally with a, a lot of uh, immunisation research, both at the scientific end and at the, the social, uh, I mean, the basic science and the so social science ends. What do you think we should be learning uh, in, in our COVID uh, response right now? What, what, what's being done so much better overseas and why are they doing it so much better, like in France where you've worked? Um, well, that's a tricky question. I think, I think, Probably, um, I would pick communication as number one. I mean, you've, you've seen these um, videos being shown of the, the different styles of communication in different countries. Um, and um, I, I'm not sure that we've really kept on top of clear communication that's engaging for, for the public. Um, I think the fact that we, you know, Australia, we don't allow direct to consumer advertising, and I'm not necessarily advocating that, but the uh, communication is quite controlled at the moment, and it's probably as a consequence restricted it compared to other markets. And, yeah. and, and if you look at the, you know, just the hunger for information on, and the types of things that people are searching for on the internet, I think we could probably do better. Um, I mean, I agree with Angela that to, to do that, we need to provide more support to the healthcare practitioners so that's probably the area that I think we've probably underestimated in in the rollout mm -hmm. I mean um, go, going to research we've, we've got some great examples of international collaboration on research um, I mean things that spring to mind because we've been um, quite close to it have been you know new vaccine candidates coming out of universities uh, preclinical research that's been done by CSIRO uh, what that's shown overall is probably two key, key weaknesses. We, you know, we lack the skilled workforce for some parts of research in Australia, in particular preclinical research and, and GMP manufacturing. Um, and also we haven't always been as internationally coordinated as, as we could have been. So um, moving more to some, perhaps some of the treatment studies for COVID now, I think we spent a lot of, we gave a lot of money to quite a lot of academic institutions to do research that perhaps um, was replicating what had been done overseas. So more international coordination would probably be the other thing I would pick. Okay. And I would uh, just add that the Immunisation Coalition website has got your white paper, our white paper, sorry, Rod, um, Jenny, so people can refer yeah. to that and please do that. Um, yeah. I think we need to have an ongoing discussion. Is there anyone else want to put their hand up or should we start wrapping up? Uh, any, oh, Kirsty, is your hand up? Um, no, but I can I can add because it's about COVID. So um, I would just follow up on um, the comments about communication. I think part of part of the issue that we've had in Australia is that we've sort of been victims of our own success. Um, we've done very well at managing the pandemic, even with the current situation. And as a result, I think people are just much less incentivized to get the vaccine. But I think what you're going to start seeing is that countries like the UK and the USA, as their cases go down, will face a similar problem. Because again, as soon as you remove the risk, the incentive is not there and people are very good about forgetting 
uh, you know, how bad the pandemic was. So I think we do have a bit of a unique communication problem in Australia. And certainly I think we need much better communication strategies to actually tackle that head on. Okay, great. Well, look, we've had um, five presentations. Uh, we really packed it in and I'm really grateful for everyone for being so clear and compelling and uh, and able to answer all, all the tricky questions that we've been throwing at you. So thank you. Um, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, I always believe in finishing earlier rather than later. And so uh, thanks to the behind the scenes people. Thanks to all the speakers today. Um, I think it's been a great day and I think we'll go on learning. And uh, I think, you know, at the Immunisation Coalition, whoever you are, um, we're making a contribution and uh, let's keep making uh, good use of the opportunities we're given to talk to individual patients and, and talk also to um, the media uh, by whatever means uh, we're asked. So thanks again and uh, go well and stay well. And uh, my brother's out of surgery and he's all right. So thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.